everyone. I'm standing in front of the House of Lords uh, in uh, England, and um, I have with me the uh, Right Honourable the Lord Naseby of the House of Lords of the British Parliament. Good day, sir. Uh, it's wonderful to see you here in London. Yes, and uh, Lord Naseby, I think uh, you have been um, widely known in Sri Lanka for someone who has always raced uh, in Sri Lanka's defence, very vocal about Sri Lankan affairs. And I'd, I'd like to know how your interest in Sri Lanka begins. Well, I started actually working in India for the Reckitt and Coleman Group right. in Calcutta. Uh -huh. And my boss called me in one morning and said, I've got good news and bad news. Good news is you are promoted. Bad news, you and your wife have to go to Colombo. Well, I knew that Colombo was an awful lot nicer than Calcutta. It was and certainly was not right. bad news. <laughs> there was no bad news there at all. <laughs> right. And I also have with uh, me a statement that you issued on Saturday uh, pertaining to Sri Lankan affairs. And I think, um, Sir Lord Naseby, if we touch on that uh, before we start on discussing more about your interests and some of uh, the statements that you've been making at the House of Lords constantly uh, pertaining to Sri Lanka and uh, the UNHRC. Yeah. Well, um, on June the 28th, uh, the Security Committee of Parliament, so that's both members of the House of Lords and the House of Commons, uh, published a report on security uh, and uh, what we call rendition. That was a situation that arose after 9-11 and the terrible uh, terrorist uh, um, twin towers with the, with the aircraft flying into them. Uh, and obviously both the US and the UK decided they had to do something to track terrorists down. Right. That we all understood. Uh, what we did not understand as representatives of the people uh, was the extent to which they would go in terms of rendition, which means capturing somebody who you think is a terrorist somewhere in the world mm -hmm. and transporting them back uh, to uh, the States mm -hmm. uh, for interrogation. And, but it was more than an interrogation. Uh, the evidence appears to be that there was torture involved uh, <clears throat> and we've heard about waterboarding and all that sort of stuff. Right. Well, I find that unacceptable. Um, I don't think that's part of uh, human rights. And then I suddenly thought at home, thinking about Sri Lanka, uh, that after the war the Sri Lankan army was accused of a whole lot of uh, alleged war crimes. Mm -hmm. And as you may recall, I. Uh, a couple of years ago now, mm -hmm. uh, had a freedom of information inquiry into Colonel Gash right. and his dispatches as the UK uh, defence attaché based in Colombo. He was there in the field from January 2009 right up to May the 18th or 19th when the Tigers were defeated. So I thought there might be something interesting in those dispatches. There was. That proved to me and I think everybody else outside that there never was a policy to kill Tamil civilians. Mm -hmm. And secondly, the numbers killed certainly were not 40,000, which is what the UN suggested, uh, was a probable number. Maybe some people in the UN said as many as 100,000. Right. But the figures there were five to 6,000. Now that prompted me to think about, well, at the same time that we, that is with Sri Lanka and those of us who take an interest, mm -hmm. uh, were re realizing what was happening in Sri Lanka, which was a war, yes, but not with all these torture and other dimensions mm -hmm. on top. At the same time as we would, you were doing that as a country, the UK and the USA were doing some of these horrendous humanitarian uh, activities. So I thought, that's wrong. And I've now called upon the UK and the USA to withdraw the motion against Sri Lanka. Because, you know, the Sri Lankans were not involved in this sort of thing. And uh, it's quite wrong that there's this motion. So I think it should be withdrawn. Right. And Lord Naseby, if we uh, I'll go back to the resolutions uh, brought forth against Sri Lanka in the UN and the one yeah. that was co-sponsored by Sri Lanka, yeah. what are your personal views and observances? Well, because Sri Lanka were in a difficult position. Mm -hmm. uh, they could have said, no, we're not going to cooperate at all. Or we will cooperate because we think we are innocent. Uh, there may have been the occasional uh, infringe, I'm sure there was, you know, and uh, it's quite right we should investigate the white flag situation, and there were one or two others perhaps. But basically I think the, your government said we will cooperate because we're innocent, 
and we want to prove that we're innocent. So that's why I think uh, you were right to join in. Uh, and I now see on the ground uh, the Missing Persons Commission. Mm -hmm. Very good. I want to see some published results from it, and so does the rest of the world. So it's high time there were some published results that people have been interviewed, uh, that people have either been found, in which case, of course, they're not missing, and a, whole, a fair number of uh, alleged missing people who've reappeared in Tamil Nadu or Canada or the UK. But assuming they are genuine missing people, then those families do need to have some compensation and be looked after. Right. Lord Dennis, if I also refer to uh, a statement you made in November 2017, what you mentioned about civilian casualties during the final stages of the conflict in Sri Lanka, you referred to the classified document of the UN as uh, uh, something that had guessed the figure of the final stages of the conflict because it was stated that it was 40,000 civilian casualties, but you in fact said um, it was just 7,000. Uh, the time Roger Paxi uh, was working alongside the UN uh, and then out of, a, out of the blue the inquiry done by three people who didn't come to the country uh, produces this figure out of the air and that's quite wrong and we now have the evidence that that's quite wrong and I'm waiting for the UN to say it's quite wrong mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong in life you can make a mistake but for heaven's sake admit it it's a terrible mistake we now know from the census from all the other evidence, from the graves and everything else, that at the most it was maybe 6,000. Out of that, we don't know how many of them were actually LTET soldiers who'd thrown away their uniform. So uh, the UN needs to recognize that nobody in the, as far as I know in Sri Lanka, uh, wants not to cooperate. They want to cooperate, but they want to cooperate on a truthful basis, not on some fictitious, made-up basis that is, where somebody has been got at by an element of the diaspora or whatever. Uh, shouldn't, shouldn't the UK play a major role in going to the UN, especially as a co-sponsor to the resolutions, and especially because of a country that has colonial history with Sri Lanka, to go in and uh, make it clear at the UNHRC, and especially because the US is also, has also withdrawn from uh, the global body? Uh, you're quite right. We should. And that's what really what I've been talking about for some years here now, and we'll keep it up. And I hope in the end we'll persuade them. Because we just lost the Foreign Secretary, as you may know, so we have a new one to convince. Uh, but we'll keep at it, yeah. We'll keep right. it. All, all right. Also, Lord Nesby, I think um, the, the international community says, although um, that, that these resolutions will help keep uh, the uh, Sri Lankan government in check and allow the minority rights be won, what are, what are your views? Well, minority rights are always important. Of course they're important. And, and I know your government, <coughs> the present government, are, are looking at some form of devolution uh, to the provinces or the regions. Uh, and that's something that uh, I welcome. Uh, we've had devolution in this country. Uh, uh, Northern Ireland has slightly different laws uh, to Scotland and slightly different laws to Wales and slightly different laws to, to England. Uh, but obviously not the major things usually to do with local government in that area uh, and I think it's understandable. In your case though I can't see the need to, for having any split. I mean you've got the northern region, you've got the northwest region, you've got the southern region, you've got the eastern region. They're all entities in their own right in my personal view. Um, if not for the resolutions, uh, sir, uh, what mechanism do you propose and suggest for Sri Lanka going forward to, uh, as a solution to what is referred to as the national question uh, of uh, Sri it's Lanka? It's not really for me to propose. I'm not there to... Uh, according uh, to your I, observances I, and what I, you've I, seen. I can only provide some guidance and some thoughts. Uh, and uh, uh, But you're a sovereign country. It's not for me to, to really perform on that area. Um, uh, I've got to watch the human rights dimension. Um, uh, I, I listen to the ICRC. Uh, they're an independent, wonderful organization. And if you took that other, that other key issue that's still rumbling away underneath, which is the alleged torture. Now, I have asked the ICRC, quietly and privately, three different r uh, senior people at different times on three different visits, have you seen any evidence, and they're everywhere in Sri Lanka, as you know as well as I do, of genuine torture as defined by the Geneva Convention? 
The answer I've had each time has been no. We have seen some heavy handling, and that's to be deplored, but not real torture. Uh, and uh, that against the report that I mentioned right at the beginning of this interview, where it was real torture, shows that there is a big difference between what the West has allowed to happen in relation to uh, terrorists and what Sri Lanka has done in relation to terrorists. Right, and I think uh, that's about uh, the interview. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Lord Naseby. And I think uh, your interest in Sri Lanka will continue to be focused in the national issue. And, I, um, and we know that you follow cricket more than football here, although the World Cup is uh, closer to home in England. Well, you know, cricket's wonderful. And I've got a young man called Prasanna working, or playing cricket for Northamptonshire. And he's very good. And before that, we had uh, Chaminda Vass and one or two others. So we have close ties still with Sri Lanka. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Pleasure sir. Pleasure's mine. We had with us uh, the Right Honourable, the Lord Sir Lord Naseby of the House of Lords of the British Parliament joining us on the show. Do stay with us. We'll be back with more. Good evening. I'm joining you tonight from the Sri Lankan High Commission at Hyde Park in London, and uh, we are we wish to speak with the Acting High Commissioner uh, of Sri Lanka in London, His Excellency Mr. Sugesh Gunaratne. Good evening, and a warm welcome to Hyde Park. Um, High Commissioner, I think. Uh, Sri Lanka and the UK, uh, we have long-standing relations and uh, the diplomatic ties date back to several decades and of course with the British uh, influence in Sri Lanka. But I'd like to know where Sri Lanka-UK relations stand today. Yes, uh, Indivari, as you said, uh, Sri Lanka's ties with the UK date back to the colonial era and currently as a Commonwealth country, uh, we do have very strong bonds of friendship. Uh, our leadership and the state apparatus at different levels work uh, very closely with each other in uh, safeguarding and also in furthering our mutual interests. And uh, I think the High Commission is uh, promoting a lot of activities to uh, strengthen ties between, uh, diplomatic ties between the two countries. Uh, what activities have you undertaken so far? Well, uh, the UK is our major, second largest trade, trading partner. It's our largest trading partner within the EU. Uh, the exports from Sri Lanka to the United Kingdom numbers around US dollars 1,300 million. Uh, if you juxtapose that with 3.2 billion uh, dollars of uh, exports to the EU, uh, a little over one third of our exports to the EU come to this country. Mm -hmm. So this is a very important market in terms of trade. Uh, there is also uh, UK's importance in terms of uh, tourism, uh, where uh, the numbers have increasingly gone up uh, over successive years. Last year we had 201,000 tourists from this country visiting Sri Lanka. So that's after China and India. Mm -hmm. this is the, largest market, certainly the largest in Europe. Right, and uh, since you spoke a lot about exports and trade, uh, the Sri Lankan, um, Sri Lankan economy has been expecting a certain amount of uh, foreign direct investment inflow into the country, uh, although we are still expect, uh, we're yet to achieve those targets in FDI um, and investment. But how can the High Commission promote uh, trade and investment in certain areas of the country to promote uh, a, a larger foreign direct investment yes. share from here? In recent times, uh, two areas we have focused on. One is the real estate market in Sri Lanka, where a lot of new condominiums are coming up in Colombo, in Kandy, in Trincomalee, and down south, and so on. Uh, so there is also the factor of the second largest Sri Lankan diaspora here, numbering over 400,000 people. So that is a great resource to tap if you want to sell real estate. Uh, most of them have dual citizenship. Uh, the government has uh, been open about the dual citizenship scheme. Mm -hmm. So a lot, we have a lot of applications uh, uh, coming through. Uh, so there are people who would like to invest their hard-earned money back in Sri Lanka 
And uh, so that is where real estate developers, especially condominium developers in Sri Lanka, can utilize this market. We in the High Commission, of course, we provide the forum and we have certain events. Recently we had uh, 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 a number of private sector uh, mm -hmm. real estate developers coming here and showcasing what right. they are doing in Sri Lanka. So that is one area. The other area is the rural BPO industry. Mm -hmm. um, now that is a very unique success story where uh, when you, one talks about BPO, one generally thinks about uh, Colombo-centered, English-speaking boys and girls in call centers. Uh, but this is not so. Uh, this is in areas like uh, uh, Jaffna in Madhavachir, mm -hmm. in Sinigama, uh, where uh, the BPOs have been quite successful. And these are not call centers, these are in accounting and finance and mm -hmm. so on. So uh, recently we had uh, an event with Informate, that's a subsidiary of John Keels, coming here and showcasing the success of the rural BPO industry in Sri Lanka mm -hmm. and how uh, the diaspora can help sustain that and grow that. Right. So uh, those are two areas that we've uh, undertaken to do and then we have done certain things. There are also another factor where uh, we try to promote Sri Lanka as a film location. Mm -hmm. um, now in recently there uh, is a reality TV show called Made in Chelsea uh, which is quite popular among teenage, uh, teenage, uh, teenagers here. Mm -hmm. Uh, which was filmed in Sri Lanka. So uh, prior to that being shown on uh, UK television here, mm -hmm. uh, so we had an event in the High Commission, uh, uh, a preview of that with uh, all the actors and actresses coming here and uh, those in the industry taking right. part. And of course that was an opportunity for us to showcase Sri Lanka as a film mm -hmm. location because not many people knew that uh, Indiana Jones was filmed yes, in Sri Lanka, in Sri Lanka. Bridge on the River Kwai right. was filmed in Sri Lanka. Yes. Um, even uh, even today there is another TV program called Good Karma Hospital that is running on. Mm -hmm. Not many people here knew that it was filmed yeah. in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. Yeah, and um, the tourism itself, as you said earlier, we, we see an increased uh, um, number of arrivals to Sri Lanka from the UK, but are there any areas that you're looking at, that you're working with uh, agents here uh, as the High Commission uh, in order to develop the tourism sector for the country? Yes, the Sri Lankan Tourism Pro Promotion Board all has long, for long had a representative here who has worked closely with the High Commission. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, we work closely with them to promote uh, not only just one area, it's not just sun, beach and sand tourism. We offer a wide range of uh, uh, things that attract the UK visitor. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, Sri Lanka is perhaps one of the few or perhaps the only place in the world where one can uh, look at the or watch the largest sea mammal mm -hmm. and the largest land mammal right. within a few miles of each other. So, so those it's are such a uh, small island. Such a small island, yes. yes. But uh, so, those are things that we can promote. In ad addition, uh, different tourists, of course, go for different things based based on their taste. Some some like adventure, some like culture, mm -hmm. uh, some like sun beach and sand, mm -hmm. uh, some like the wildlife. Uh, bird watching and so on. So uh, Sri Lanka fortunately caters to all those interests. Right. Uh, also High Commissioner going back to the trade related uh, areas. Now I think we are very much speaking about Brexit, the EU and the European, uh, the European Union and the UK's uh, departure from a single market. But since, like you said, yes, uh, most of our exports di directed to the EU are in fact to the UK. So does this mean Brexit wouldn't uh, at all affect our export market to the EU and the GSP concessions? Well, at this point of time, uh, I, I suppose no one would really know what arrangements would come into place once the UK exits the EU, but we are working closely with the UK authorities uh, to try and ensure that those arrangements that come into place uh, do not derogate from the current arrangements. For example, Sri Lanka is a part uh, beneficiary of the GSP plus trading concessions. We would ideally like to retain that within the U UK, even though UK might exit the EU. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, talking about the diaspora before we um, uh, end our interview, um, High Commissioner, I think, uh, as you mentioned earlier, a largest, the largest diaspora, perhaps uh, Sri Lankan diaspora, is uh, um, featured in this part of the world. And I think they can work together for the betterment of uh, the country as a whole for Sri Lanka. And how does the High Commission work with them? Well, the UK has the second largest Sri Lankan diaspora mm -hmm. in the world, okay. uh, numbering over 400,000, and that translates into 
all the different uh, denominations of Sri Lankan society. Uh, we, of course, work with different layers of the diaspora uh, to try and uh, promote uh, Sri Lanka in many ways. And uh, uh, there are events in the High Commission. We make it a point to celebrate the four national festivals of Sri Lanka, Vesak, Iftar, mm -hmm. uh, Deepavali, and mm -hmm. Christmas. In addition, there are other trade and tourism promotional events that we hold. Uh, so we get the diaspora involved and work closely with a lot of organizations uh, that are active here. A lot of them also engage in number of charitable endeavors back home. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, we work closely with them, we'll continue to do so. And we have all communities represented here in the UK from Sri of Lanka. Uh, probably the best place to start reconciliation and national unity dialogue. Thank no, you very thank much, you very High much. Commissioner, for your time. Thank you very much. We'll see you again at the same time next week.